Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. All right, why don't we we'll stand and begin in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly King, Comforter, Spirit of Truth, everywhere present and filling all things, the treasury of blessings and the giver of life. Come and dwell within us, cleanse us of all stain, and save our souls, O gracious one. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you all for coming out this evening. Please welcome back Dr. Timothy O'Donnell, President of Christendom College. Well, good to see you all again. Thank you for coming, and thank you to Deacon Sabatino, Institute of Catholic Culture, for all the great work that you are doing out here. Uh, it's always, it is always a joy to be here. I realized for the Book of Science I gave three talks, and now having gone through this again, I feel like I should have done three for the Book of Glory. But we can't, so we'll do what we can uh, tonight. Uh, I always feel it's very important, although we, we did in fact pray in our Father, but uh, let's invoke, because this is so rich and so important as we're on the, the cusp of Holy Week, let's invoke the Holy Spirit. Can you join me in a prayer? In the name of the Father, and the Son, of the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and enkindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray, O God, who did instruct the hearts of thy faithful, by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us by the same Spirit to have a right judgment in all things, and ever to rejoice in his consolation, through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I would like to pick up, in a sense, where we left off, if that's okay. We're still in the Book of Glory, but I feel there's so much more richness in that Last Supper. I know we have to get to the Passion, and we need to get to the Resurrection, and we, we will do that. But at least for the first 15 minutes to go back to where we were in the, in the Last Supper, all right? Recalling how important that is as we prepare to enter into Holy Week with Palm Sunday. I hope this is something that you would go back to and read prayerfully. Read it slowly. Don't sort of race through it. Take just two verses and just prayerfully reflect on those and ask the Lord to speak to your heart in terms of what he wants to communicate to you. A gentleman had just asked me a question about the translation I use. I always use the Confraternity Edition, if you are interested in. I think it is the most beautiful. It is very accurate. It has the more timely expressions such as, Amen, Amen, Dico Vobis, Amen, Amen, I say to you, and things like that. But it was the first effort to update the old Douay Reims version that had all sorts of archaic sort of showistist and things like that that was a little too archaic. But it maintained thee and thou and amen, amen, I say to you. And if you're interested in that translation, Scepter Press, which is handled by Opus Dei, uh, still publishes a beautiful, small but beautiful New Testament with notes that you can put in your coat pocket and carry everywhere. And it has a beautiful little blue ribbon and it's designed for you to read the entire New Testament in one year. They have set every day set off for a particular scripture reading and you can start either in June or in December but if you do that you'll read the entire New Testament in one year and it's, just, it's a great way so I highly recommend it Scepter Press has two versions of the New Testament but both of them are the Confraternity Translation if you're interested in that translation you have your Bible stick with it I'm sure it's fine but someone had asked the question so I just share that with you Okay, we had finished chapter 14, so I'd like to pick up on 15, again reminding all of us that at this Last Supper, 
ev virtually everything that we are hearing is unique to John's Gospel. There's echoes of this in the synoptic tradition, but everything is really unique to John's Gospel. And this is because John was so intimate with the Lord. Remember, he was the beloved disciple who at the Last Supper sat at Jesus' right, leaning on his left elbow, and was able to recline on the bosom of Jesus, recline on his heart. So everything that was spoken made a deep, deep and lasting impression on this man. So we need to reflect that when we're reading John, we're back at the Last Supper. These are the things that the eyewitness, the disciple whom Jesus loved, who reclined on his heart, recalls to us. So let's start with chapter 15 and go there. Beautiful, beautiful teaching. Another one of those I am statements. Remember, there are seven great I am statements in John's Gospel. I am statements which are really revealing who he is. Seven, remember, is the biblical number of fulfillment, completion. So seven I am's that reveal who Jesus is to us. So we start in chapter 15, verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that bears no fruit he will take away, and every branch that bears fruit he will cleanse. Welcome to Lent. He will cleanse that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it remains on the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. And notice how a good teacher, he repeats himself. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Nothing. This beautiful image of the vine. Notice he says, I'm the true vine. All throughout the Old Testament, Israel is the Lord's vineyard. And God, the Lord God, is always taking care of that. Now he's taking it further. He says, I am the vine in the vineyard. All right? And so you need to abide in me. And if you've ever worked among the vines, we now have wine here in Virginia. We're sort of wine country here in Virginia. At least out in the Shenandoah Valley we are. But you really get a sense how true that is, that if a branch becomes separated from the vine, it cannot bear fruit. It will only wither and die. And the wood of the vine was very soft and very, very supple. And that why there was a prohibition, because a lot of times for the burning of the sacrifices in the temple of Jerusalem, there was an actual prohibition, you're not to use vine branches, because it was not considered good wood. So when you're cut off from the vine, you're not good. You're not going to bear fruit. But if you are bearing fruit, what's the Father going to do? Prune you even more, because the more you are pruned, the more fruit you're going to bear. So welcome to Lent, all right? Suffering is a good thing. It is a good thing. As one spiritual writer once said, suffering, this is really tough because it goes against the grain of human nature in a way, suffering for the Christian should have a greater appeal to us than pleasure to the pagan. Apart from him, you can... Do, I'll let that hang out there for a while. <laughs> Apart from me, you can do nothing. And so this beautiful image, just as in the vine, the sap flowing into the branches, we need to be grafted in him. And that's why when we jump after that to verse 12, he again goes back and emphasizes his new commandment. Look at verse 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love than this no one has, that one lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do the things I command you. So it's not just the words, it's not just talking the talk, it's walking the walk. Doing what he commands. And what's the one thing he commands? Love one another. All men will know you're my disciples. So that means what? Generally, as human beings, we don't love one another, do we? We gossip, we're malicious, we're hateful, we kill one another. That's why G.K. Chesterton said the one doctrine of the Catholic Church that doesn't need to be proved is the doctrine of original sin. <laughs> There's something clearly wrong with us. But that's why when you look at the channel of grace unleashed in history, the impact that if people think that Christianity has not had an impact on our world, where do the hospitals originate? 
Where do the orphanages originate? Where is the sense of fundamental human rights and the dignity of the human person? That's the fruit of Jesus Christ. That's the fruit of the church. That's our Catholic faith. That's where it comes from. So he says, you are my friends if you do the things I command. No longer do I call you servants because the servant does not know what his master does. But I have called you friends because all things that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. Remember last supper, you're ready to die. This is when the heart becomes opened and the things that are most deep and most personal are communicated. The Greek word there actually technically is not servant, it's slave. You're not slaves. It's doulos. And doulos in the Old Testament was a term of high praise. Abraham was the doulos of God. Moses was the doulos of God. He was the slave of God. He was the servant of God. But this shows you the radical newness of Christianity because Christ says, you're no longer servants because you know. And there's a fundamental equality that's going to be established. You're no longer slave. You're a friend. You're a friend of what? Friend of God incarnate. You're a friend of the Father because you know what the Father says. This is an elevation that we have never seen in sacred history. Nothing like this has ever been spoken of before. We've never seen this in the Old Testament. And the reason is, is because the vine and the branches. He's going to abide in us. That's why in this chapter and in the next chapter, what does he keep talking about? Who's he going to send? The Holy Spirit. He's going to send the paraclete. Because why? We have the divine life in us. Now, as Aristotle observes, in order to have friendship, friendship presumes a certain equality, right? There has to be a certain quality if you're going to be friends, all right? But what kind of equality can there be with God? All right? What kind of friendship is possible? Aristotle taught that God cannot love. Christianity comes along and teaches that God is love. So you hear people talking about, oh, the Hellenization of Christianity. It's a bunch of nonsense. They took from the Greeks and Greek philosophy what was good and would apply to the gospel, but what didn't, they rejected totally. Friendship requires a certain equality. What's the equality? With the life of grace, every one of us who are baptized, what do we have dwelling inside of us? Sanctifying grace, the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So what becomes possible because we have divine life? Abide in me and I in you. The Father and I will come and we will make our dwelling in him. All right? And so there is this fundamental equality of friendship. That's why we can talk to him. That's why Teresa of Avila, when she starts talking about prayer, what is prayer? It's conversation with he whom we know loves us. There's a basic equality because of the life of grace that our Lord is talking about here. So we are elevated to the level of friendship. But then go on to verse 18. He says something else that we hit upon briefly last week. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before you. If you were of the world, the world would love what is its own. But because you are not of the world, I have chosen you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. Remember the word that I have spoken to you. No servant is greater than his master. If they have persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they have kept my word, they will keep yours also. Now, how does he identifies with the apostles? Because why? They're no longer servants. What are they? Friends. So if they're treating the master that way, they're going to treat you. Now, why the world's hatred? Remember the three senses of the world that we talked about last week. There's the world of creation, which is good, right? God so, you know, that basically God looked at everything created. It was very good. There's also the world of the society of men. God so loved the world, he sent his son. But there's that third sense. It's the spiritus mundi. It is the spirit of the world. The Lord does not pray that for that. Are we in the world as Christians? Absolutely. But we are in the world, but we are not of it. We don't belong to it. We belong to Christ. We are riveted to him. And we follow his teaching. We follow his way. We do not follow the maxims of the world which emphasizes glory, power, violence, wealth, prestige, money. Those are the things you sell your soul for those things to get on the cover of the Rolling Stone. All right? 
Pope Francis gave it all up, and guess where he ended up? On the cover of the Rolling Stone. Oh, the divine irony of that. All right. Anyway, so hopefully this makes sense to you. So the world's hatred, the world will hate. But just as the Father sends the Son, and now the Son says he's going to send the Spirit, so the Trinity is going to send out the apostles. Remember, the apostles are someone, apostle is someone who is sent. All right. So the same mission to communicate the same truth. And is there going to be persecution? Yes. Is there going to be suffering? Are you going to be pruned? But what should the attitude be? Yes. More fruit. Joy in the midst of suffering. Joy in the midst of suffering. All right. And that's, that's why Fulton Sheen used to say all the time when he would pass by hospitals, he says, there is nothing so tragic as wasted pain. If you've got the flu, if you've got a physical ailment, if you have a suffering, offer it up. Give it to him. It's a source of incredible grace for yourself and for the church, for other people who are suffering in the church or languishing in the church. That doctrine of the mystical body that we're all one in Christ. If one member suffers, everybody suffers. And if one, the more members that are healthy, that are vibrant, that are doing what they should be doing, other members are affected by that grace. There was a great little essay once written by Cardinal Newman, I forget where it was, but he talked about a, a Catholic somewhere in Europe who just devoutly bowed his head and simply made the sign of the cross with faith. Every time we make the sign of the cross, the Father turns his undivided attention to us. And then Newman said, and in a far off mission land on the shores where a priest was struggling with his vocation to try to reach these people, a fresh wind of grace blew over his soul. Simply because someone somewhere made the sign of the cross. I'm using poetic license there, but that's the essence of what Newman said there. So we then go on into chapter 16. Chapter 16 is a duplicate of chapter 14. It parallels. Jesus is a good teacher. Every good teacher is going to do what? Repeat himself, right? Repetition is the mother of all learning. You say it once, some will have it. Say it twice, okay, we get it. And so that's what he begins doing again. And he talks about the Spirit coming, which is going to be the great teacher of truth. Like if you look at verse 13. But when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will teach you all truth. Everything that Jesus has taught will be brought back to us. And who's he talking to? The apostles. So the apostles are going to receive the Spirit of truth because they're going to go forth and they're going to teach like Jesus will teach. Remember, during the earthly ministry, only Jesus teaches. All right? The apostles are sent out to preach. But after Pentecost, when the Spirit comes, they no longer just preach. They go out and they teach. And they teach with authority, just like the Master, just like Jesus did. So the church is the extension in time of the incarnation. It's the extension of Jesus' ministry. So the Spirit will be the great teacher of truth. Now, one other thing I want to point to, because it's going to move us towards the Passion account, which we want to get to. And if you look at verse uh, 19, and then we'll go from there. But Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him. And he said to them, You inquire about this among yourselves, because I said, A little while, and you shall not see me. And again, a little while, you shall see me. Because he knows. He's in charge of his passion. He knows exactly what's going to happen. And he's going to be taken away. But then he's going to come back again. So it refers to being taken away, which is the passion. But he's going to come back again, which is appointing to his resurrection. His resurrection. And so he goes on. Amen, amen, I say to you that you shall weep and lament that the world shall rejoice. Now the world he's talking about is the Spiritus Mundi, right? That worldly spirit. Thank goodness we got rid of him. That's over with. <laughs> All right, he who laughs last, laughs best. Sheston said the one thing that Jesus hid was his laughter in the Gospels. So what did he do up on the mountain? He says, I think he laughed. That's very Chestertonian. I don't know if it's very biblical, but anyway, that's what he said. All right, so we go on from there. You will, the world shall rejoice, and you shall be sorrowful, but your j sorrow shall turn into joy. Now look at verse 21. It's intriguing. 
It says in most translations, a woman. But in the original Greek, it is not a woman. It's the woman. Now, that's very important for us. This is at the Last Supper. The woman about to give birth has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has brought forth the child, she no longer has remembered the anguish for her joy that a man has been born into the world. And you therefore have sorrow now, but I will see you again and your heart shall rejoice and your joy no one shall take from you. And in that day you shall ask me nothing. Amen, amen, I say to you, if you ask the Father anything in my name, he will give it to you. You ask in his name. Why? Because in that day, where will he be? In heaven, at the right hand of the Father, in glory, showing the Father his wounds. Look at my hands, look at my feet, look at my side. See how much I love them, Father. Listen to them. We have an advocate in heaven, and it's a joy. But isn't it interesting, the woman, only in John's gospel, in chapter 19, we're going to find a reference to the woman again, aren't we? Woman, behold thy son. All right. The hour is always associated with Jesus' suffering, but here he says, the woman also is going to have her hour. Because who's going to be intimately united? Who's with him every step of the way and standing at the foot of the cross? It's his mother. It's his mother. And here he's giving the Eucharist in the context of the Last Supper. He's giving his body and blood. And where did he get his body and blood? Got it from her. He received everything from her. And that's why if our Lord really wanted women priests, he would have made his mother a priest. All right? But she certainly functions in a priestly way, doesn't she? If there's anyone we could think of who could have said truly, as she stood at the foot of that cross, looking at the bleeding, lacerated body of her son, who could have said, this is my body. This is my blood. It's her, right? Who gave him his body? Who gave him the blood? That was all Mary. And she makes that offering. What an incredible offering it is. I know we're jumping to the passion, but he's already thinking of her hour because her heart, which is going to be pierced with a sword, just like his heart is going to be pierced with a lance. Okay, those two hearts are so intimately united. And that's why when he's taken down from the cross, the greatest image we have of that, of course, is found in St. Peter's Basilica. How many of you have been to St. Peter's Basilica? Oh, it's so great. All right. Then you know what's right on the right side when you come into the basilica, right? The Pieta, Michelangelo's Pieta. And remember what's being shown there. You go up and it's so beautiful because her left hand is pulling, hugging Christ so closely to herself. And if you look at the fingers of Mary, she's pressing into his garment and into his flesh, showing what, how much she loves him. But what's she doing with the other hand? The other hand, the right hand, is open and outstretched, and she's offering him to us, showing what she loves her son because she's the mom, but she also loves us because she's our mother as well. That's why going back to Cana, her final last words in sacred scripture are, do whatever he tells you. And so that's why she's standing at the foot of the cross. And what a Eucharistic offering, right? What is she holding? The body blood, soul, and divinity, right, of Jesus. And that's why when you look at that Pieta, you see this. It's so fitting that that's your entry into St. Peter's because it is a Eucharistic offering. So Mary also has her great hour as he prepares to leave the world. When you go on to 17, it's so beautiful. Chapter 17 is what we call the high priestly prayer. And it's so wonderful of Jesus and so wonderful John that he wrote this down because Jesus could have just prayed privately right but we're getting a glimpse into how Jesus prays this is his prayer as the high priest all right and John listening to this it makes an indelible mark and of course filled with the Holy Spirit he writes down what Jesus said here in chapter 17 he's on the cusp of eternity 
his humanity. He knows he's going out to his death. He will soon be ascending to his father. And he makes this priestly prayer for what? For the church, for his apostles, for each and every one of us. So look at 17. These things Jesus spoke and raising his eyes to heaven. The last time John said he raised his eyes to heaven was in John 6. All right? I am the bread, okay, the loaves and the fishes, which is deeply and profoundly Eucharistic. So again, raising his eyes to heaven, where he's going to be going. What does he say? Father, the hour has come. The hour in John's gospel is always his passion. The hour has come. Glorify thy son, that thy son may, be, may glorify thee, even as thou hast given him power over all flesh, in order that to all those thou hast given him, he may give everlasting life. Now this is everlasting life, that they may know thee, the only true God, and him whom thou hast sent, Jesus Christ. And he goes on to say, I have glorified thee on earth. So the amazing thing is his glorification is his hour of humiliation. All right. Remember, there's three steps on the ladder of his glorification. The first step, when I am lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. When is he lifted up? First, on the cross. Second, he's lifted up on Easter Sunday morning with the resurrection. And the last one, the ascension into glory. Three rungs of the ladder of his glorification. But the nefarious cross, the scandal, the shame, that is his moment of glory. Because what is he doing? He is obeying the Father's will. And in accepting the suffering, he shows that there is no suffering that anyone can experience that he has not experienced first in all of its depths. That's why Mel Gibson's movie is so great in terms of capturing the external suffering. But imagine what it would be like in the garden. All right? <laughs> okay, we have to talk about that. All right. So he talks about the Spirit as the great teacher of truth in 17, and he prays for his church. Everything in this great priestly prayer as he lifts up, he's giving everything back to the Father. So what does he pray for? He prays for his disciples. Notice he says, I pray not for the world. I pray not for the world. But I pray for my followers that they may be sanctified in truth. The best defense against the worldliness and the spirit of spiritus mundi and the devil is that we be grounded in truth. And what does he say is the truth? Thy word is truth. So being deeply grounded in Christ's word is where we all want to be. And so that's when he talks and he prays and the thing that he wants is unity. That there may be a unified witness. And the greatest witness is the common charity that we share. That we really show samples of loving one another. Because that's what's going to attract people to Christ. You need to teach doctrine. You need to do all of those things. But it's the love. It's the example that's going to bring. Right? And so there's an old Latin expression. I'll give it to you in English. You know, <laughs> Teaching is of interest, but it's example that draws people. All right. It's the example that draws. So it's the love. And so he goes on in verse nine. I pray for them, not for the world do I pray, but for those whom thou hast given me, because they are thine and all things that are mine are thine and thine are mine. And I am glorified in them. It's a beautiful thing. If you're a Christian, if you're a Catholic, Jesus is glorified in you. He's glorified in your faith. The fact that you are living the faith, even if you, you know, you're struggling with whatever, sin or temptation, but the fact that you're struggling is a source of joy to him. Why? Because he died for us. Even when we were sinners, he died for us. So he's giving us this grace. And so when we appropriate the grace, every time we pray, we're giving him joy, right? You wouldn't even be praying if he hadn't first given you what? Grace. Every time you pray, there's grace. And you think, oh, God's not close to me. Every time you pray a rosary, divine mercy chaplet, go to mass, you're swimming in a sea of grace. You wouldn't have a single good thought. You would never pray unless he was giving you grace. You need to reflect upon that. He's closer to us than we are to ourselves. Every time we pray, we're responding to a gift. So that's why it causes him joy, because everything that he suffered is for us. 
It's not for himself. It's for us. And when he sees us appropriating that grace and living that grace by prayer and good works, it causes him joy. And so he goes, and I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I am coming to thee. Holy Father, keep in thy name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one even as we are. How's that for unity? The same unity that exists between the Father and Son, that's what he wants in his church among Christians. And that's why we need to guard that and try to protect that as best we can. So he keeps going on and on. Look again at verse 20. Very important for us, because he says where? Yet not for these only do I pray, his apostles there that night, but for those also who through their words are to believe in me, that they all may be one, even as thou, Father, in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Ecumenism is not an option. We all have to be ecumenical. It is a profound scandal that we as Christians are divided. Whether it's Russian, Orthodox, Greek, Orthodox, Catholic, and Protestant, we need to be one. Imagine the power, imagine the witness, if all Christians came back together under the Holy Father. Imagine the impact that that would have worldwide, morally, ethically, in terms of faith, in terms of protecting human dignity, if all Christians were working together. But that's the type of unity that he left us. And it's because of our sin that there is that division. And we in the church sinned mightily at the time of the Reformation. Church did not need a Reformation in her doctrine, but she did need a reform in morals. And many people were alienated from the church because of the way in which we were living as a church. And we need to acknowledge that. That a lot of times we gave counter witness. Yeah, we were right on the doctrine, but we gave counter witness. It wasn't see how those Catholics love one another. All right? And we need to see that. And so Jesus in this profound moment is calling for unity. But notice who he's praying for. He's praying for you and for me. Not only for these, but those who are going to believe because of their word. Who's that? That's everybody in this room. Because it's the apostles and their successors who preach and teach and proclaim that word. That's why we are Catholic. That's why we are Christian. So he's pray- So remember, he's on the cusp of eternity. He's going back to the Father. And so he's looking down through the corridors of time, and he's not only praying for the apostles, for everyone who will believe because of their word. Because that authoritative word, guided by the Holy Spirit, is the same word that he spoke. Because the mission of Jesus goes on. Make sense to everybody? Okay, here we go. Chapter 18. We start the Passion. Judas left, and it was night. All right? So we go on in chapter 18. After saying these things, Jesus went forth with his disciples beyond the torrent of Kedron, where there was a garden into which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew this place, since Jesus had often met there together with his disciples. Judas then taking the cohort... And attendants from the chief priests and Pharisees came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Ah, oh, there's so much in here. Oh, I wish we had two more, two more classes. All right. First of all, notice it's the torrent of Kedron that they cross. Because you have to cross that torrent as you go into Gethsemane. Where there are still olive trees, even though it's true, the Romans cut down all of the olive trees during the siege of Jerusalem. When they took Jerusalem and sacked it in 70 A.D. If you know anything about olive trees, what does an olive tree do when you cut it down? It grows right back. So those trees that are in the Garden of Gethsemane are the literally descendants of those very same trees that he saw that night. Now it's a torrent of Kedron. Why? What time of year is this? It's Passover, so you know what time of year it is, right? Spring, so there's a lot of rain, all right? So it's a torrent. Now we know for a fact that all of the sacrifices in the temple there was a trough that ran from the temple and they would slaughter the lambs, slaughter the oxen, whatever animals were being slaughtered. There was a torrent that ran off through this sort of viaduct from the temple altar where all the blood was to get rid of the blood because there was a lot of blood, all right? Would pour all the way down from the temple and guess where it dumped into? The torrent of Kedron. That's how they got rid of the blood. 
Now, it's Passover, so what's up in the sky? Passover, what's up in the sky? Full moon, all right? You're crossing the torrent of Kidron, shimmering in the moonlight through the water. What does he look down and he, what's he see in that water? Blood and water. <laughs> That's going to be important later on, right? Blood and water, all right? From all, from all those animals and from the lambs, all right? And so here's the true lamb crossing the torrent, going off to his agony, the garden, and he sees the blood and water flowing in the light of a full paschal moon. Beautiful, haunting, all right? Judas brings the whole cohort. The cohort of the Romans, that's 600 men. That is amazing. It tells us something about the power of Jesus, that you not only have the temple guard, you have the Romans there too. Pilate's in on this. He must know that they're planning to arrest him. And so you send a veritable army out to arrest him with swords, clubs, lanterns. Do you see the power of this man? What's he going to do? They're not really sure. And so they all go out, and he takes them all, including the, you know, the temple guards. But remember what the temple guards, and we're going to see what happens when he talks to them. Jesus, therefore, knowing all that was to come upon him, went forth and said to them, Whom do you seek? Notice his courage. He goes out to face Judas and the multitude. Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he using the divine name. I am he. All right. Now Judas who betrayed him was also standing there. When therefore he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. They're spooked. Remember the temple guard? Temple guard in Luke's gospel had been sent out to arrest him. Do you remember that? Go out and arrest him. And instead of arresting him, they were arrested by his words. They came back to the, they came back to the chief priest and what do they say? No man has ever spoken like this man. No one. And so they're sent on their assignment. It's probably not an assignment they want to do. All right? Who are you seeking? He's going to be a coward. We're going with lanterns and swords and ferret him out like an animal, a hunted animal. He walks out to greet them. Who do you seek? Jesus of Nazareth. I am he. He utters the divine name. They fall back. All right? And so he asked them again, whom do you seek? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore you seek me, let these go their way. Again, who's he thinking about? Yes, I have not lost any of those you have given me, Father. And so he continues to think of others, even when his life is on the line. And he's saying, I'm the one, let them go. All right? But notice in verse 10, Simon Peter, therefore having a sword, drew it and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. Now the servant's name was Malchus. Jesus therefore said to Peter, put up thy sword into the scabbard. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? Notice what does he mention? Shall I not drink the cup? Do you see why that's important? What's that link us to? The garden. Remember all the synoptics talked about the cup. You know, let this cup pass from me. Now, John doesn't mention the agony, but clearly he show, he's aware of that and says, am I not to drink this cup? All right. Now, again, Peter always gets hammered and he, he should be hammered because of the triple denial. But at this one moment, you've got Romans, you've got temple guard, and they're coming to get him. And what does Peter do? He takes his sword. This is Roland at Roncesvalles. Now he reveals himself to be a good fisherman. He just cuts a guy's ear off. But let's not deny, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, that's not very good. But let's not deny the courage that's there, right? That's an act of real courage. Because what he had just said to Jesus before they left, I will die for you. I'll lay down my life for you. And then Jesus, before this night is over, all right, before the cock crows, you will have denied three times that you even know me. But does he show courage here? Absolutely. And it's only when our Lord says, I need to drink the cup, put the sword away, and then the mystery of evil encircles our Lord, and he yields himself into the power of sinful men, that then he becomes terrified. They lead him off to Caiaphas for a night inquiry. Night trials, of course, were completely and totally illegal. Should never have happened. That's why they have to take him on eventually to Annas for Annas and then Caiaphas eventually. Now it's very interesting to note that in the Jewish Talmud and Jewish tradition, the house of Annas 
is considered one of the most corrupt, money-grubbing, blackmail, bribery. They were considered completely corrupt. He owned all of the kiosks at the temple that sold all of the animals that controlled the coin changing, right? Where you could not use, you could only use the Jewish shekel, you couldn't use a Roman denarius, so you'd have to change in your money. You know what the exchange rate was like? <laughs> it wasn't very good. They're making tons of money. So imagine how Annas and Caiaphas felt about this man who when he entered into the temple, what did he do? Drove him out. Stop this. End this. He drove everyone out. The only one he spoke to, right, were those who were selling the turtle doves, where he said, take these things away. Because who bought the turtle doves? The poor. All right? Preferential option. All right? So interesting. Interesting. So they have had this guy in their sights for a long time. And they want him dead. And so they immediately go on, and the trial goes on. Jesus is struck with a blow, which is totally a total violation of Jewish law, should never have happened. And that's why you see in verse 22, Now when he had said these things about speaking openly, and everyone has heard me, one of the attendants who was standing by struck Jesus a blow, saying, Is that the way thou dost answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken ill, bear witness to the evil. But if well, why do you strike me? Do you notice he's still the teacher? He's still totally, they try to degrade him, strike him a disrespectful blow. What have I done? He is the one who is in his right mind. He is the one who continues to speak the truth. And Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. And then we go on, and you have Peter's denial, and then the cock crows. Now, there were three watches of the Roman guards, and it's interesting to note that the third watch was basically from midnight to three, and they called that the Galicinium, the cock's crow. And that was a trumpet that would blow, indicating the next watch was to take place. So there might have been an actual cock crow, or it might have been the blasting of the trumpet, you know, the Galicinium, that they might have heard. And uh, I do have some roosters down below where we live. And let me tell you, they don't just crow at dawn. They're crowing throughout the night most of the time, including at that time. Now, eventually, we move on to the trial before Pilate. And the fact that they're bringing him to Pilate, remember, the Jews are not allowed to kill anybody. That's why if he had that woman stone who was caught in adultery, it would have put him in a really difficult position with the Roman authorities. It was a perfect trap. He's either going to not deny the Mosaic law or he's going to violate the Roman law. All right. But, of course, he was able to work his way through it by transcending both. And so now we're in a situation where they're bringing him to the praetorium. Okay, early in that morning on that Friday. Remember, Passover is going to begin at sundown that evening. And so there's a flurry of activity in most Jewish homes. And uh, reflecting upon what's going to take place here, very, very significant. The number of pilgrims that would flock, we know from Josephus that 30 years after uh, Jesus had lived, there were over 2,350,000 pilgrims that came to Jerusalem for the Passover which means that there had to be close to 235,000 Paschal lambs slaughtered in Jerusalem. Imagine the blood, all right? Imagine the people that were there to witness this incredible event. And so they can't enter into the praetorium, all right, because they would be defiled, because it's a Gentile residence, all right? So look at verse 29. Pilate therefore went outside to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They said to him in answer, If he were not a criminal, we should not have handed him over to thee. Pilate therefore said to him, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews then said, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. So he knows, what do the Jews want to happen to him? Kill him, but what kind of killing? Crucifixion. Okay, he's a criminal, all right? He needs to be crucified, all right? So immediately it's about capital punishment. They're not, they don't want their law. They want the jus gladi, the law of the sword. They want him executed, and they want the Romans to do this. This is a fellow Jew they're turning over to the Gentiles, to the secular authority, 
All right. And so he's forcing them by his questioning to push this. Pilate, therefore, again, entered in the praetorium and he summoned Jesus and said to him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Dost thou say this of thyself, or have others told thee of me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thy own people and the chief priests have delivered thee to me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. Notice the preposition. Is it in the world? Yes, it is. But it is not of the world. All right? If my kingdom were of this world, my father followers would have thought that I might not be delivered to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, Thou art then a king. Jesus answered, Thou sayest it. I am a king. This is why I was born and why I have come into this world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? Now, whether that was cynical, whether he was genuinely interested, but as you notice, as you read John, on at least three occasions, Pilate tries to release him. He does not want to condemn this man. So we go on. And when he said this, he went outside to the Jews again and said to them, I find no guilt in him. He's an innocent man. All right. Just like his wife. We know from Luke who had trouble in a dream. Remember that? Have nothing to do with that just man. I have suffered greatly because of a dream. Here Pilate's own wife says, he's righteous. He's good. Don't do anything to him. You wonder what was in that dream. What did she dream? Hmm. Interesting. All right. Well, we go from there. All right. So we go on. And when he had said this, he went outside to the Jews again and said, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I should release someone to you at the Passover. Do you wish, therefore, that I release to you the king of the Jews? Therefore, they cried out again, not this man, but Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was a robber. In insurrectionists. Now notice his name. Bar Abbas. Son of the Father. There's a tradition that said his first name was Joshua. You know what that would make him? Jesus, son of the Father. So you have a choice. Do you want Jesus the Nazarene or the son of the Father? Who's the real son of the Father? It's Jesus. What a contrast. But they, don't, they want to pick their own God. They want their own Savior. They want Barabbas. They want insurrection, robbery, political liberation. They don't want the divine plan. And they'll go to any length, even having a Gentile crucify one of their fellow Jews. All right? So go on to 19. Pilate then took Jesus and had him scourged. Okay, the, beautifully portrayed. The, the Roman scourgings were horrible. Um, we know that many, many people died from the scourging alone. It had bone, metal thongs, etc. It was a brutal, brutal practice. And uh, he was subjected, if the shroud is accurate, and I believe it is, to a, it was not just 39 stripes. He was beaten and beaten severely, front and back. Of course, the, the, the leather straps would have wrapped around the body and would have bruised him. Uh, in a horrible way. Plating a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and arrayed him in a purple cloak. And they kept coming to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him. We know from the synoptics the whole cohort came out. That's 600 men. We know that the Roman soldiers were drawn from Assyria, so they would have been Syrians. All right? And of course, the Syrians had total contempt for the Jews. So anyone said, You're King of the Jews? That would have been a source of total mockery and contempt to them. And so what we're finding here, put a crown of thorns on him, cover him with the purple. You're king of the Jews. And then they took good care of him. So that scourging was an unchaining of demons because this is his hour. It's the hour of darkness. Like when Judas went out, it is night. All right. The light shines, but there's every effort done now to extinguish that light. Pilate therefore went outside and said to them, Behold, I bring him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. Talk about Roman justice. He's innocent. He's guilty. So what am I going to do? Beat him. Flog him. All right. Now maybe he was hoping that the sight would bring forth pity when you see him. 
All right. Jesus, therefore, came forth wearing the crown of thorns and the purple cloak. And he said to them, Ecce homo, behold the man. And the Greek word is very interesting. It's like what is actually being said is, behold man. Behold man. This is what man looks like. Right? How do we treat one another down through history? We beat each other, we spit upon each other, we tear each other apart. That's man. And that's why he came to reform and to reshape man. Because that is the human condition before Christ comes. All right? That is the human. Behold man. He becomes a man like us in every single thing except sin. All right? Now, we're dealing with his physical suffering, but remember in the garden, he <laughs> takes upon himself the sins of all the world. I mean, from the sin of Adam, the murder of Cain, the betrayal of Judas, every, every murder, every rape, every mal malicious act of gossip, every single thing from beginning to end. Talk about the suffering. The physical suffering is pale by comparison to what it must have meant to him physically. It's no wonder he sweated blood when he took that upon himself. Hematidrosis is what it's called. And physicians know this. When a person is under severe mental duress, the capillaries near the surface of the skin burst, and it gives the image of sweating blood. What always happens, the person laps into a state of coma, because you can't bear that. But, of course, he doesn't lapse into coma. All right? He's in control of his passion. He chooses to drink it all to the last drop. And that's what he's doing in this passion. Now, can you imagine seeing a man crowned with thorns? As Louis of Granada says, those two great eyes window the soul, so to the light in the heavens, you can almost not even see him because of the blood and the sweat and the crown of thorns. All right? And you're looking at someone in that state. And he says, Behold the man, but instead of pity, look at verse 6. When therefore the chief priests and the attendants saw him, they cried out, Crucify him. Just like Jesus cried out at Lazarus. Remember that from last week? He cries out, Lazarus, come forth. Jesus cries out to give life. They cry out to give death. Crucify him. Crucify him. Pilate said to him, take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. Again, this is the third time now Pilate said, no guilt. The Jews answered him, we have a law, and according to that law, he must die because he made himself son of God. Do the Jews know what he's claiming? Absolutely. They accuse him of plan. He's claiming to be the son of God. He's claiming to be equal to God. He calls God his father. They get it better than most of our modern exegetes get it. All right. They know that he's claiming divinity. All right. And of course, this causes Pilate to wonder greatly. And so he goes in and he asks him again, where are you from? And you have all of these probing questions. And then look at 13, after speaking to Jesus and hearing that, about the charge of blasphemy, this is the Son of God, look what happens. And then Pilate from then on was looking for a way to release him. But the Jews cried out saying, If thou release this man, thou art no friend of Caesar. For everyone who makes himself a king sets himself against Caesar. This is his weak spot. He's already had two incidences in his procuratorship where he opposed the Jews. The Jews appealed to Caesar and he was overturned on two previous occasions. And so now this is the trump card because as procurator, one of his titles was, you are the friend of Caesar. If you're the, you are the friend of Caesar. Ah, anyone who makes himself king is no friend of Caesar. Like you, Pilate, you're the friend of Caesar. All right. Pilate, therefore, when he had heard these words, brought Jesus outside and sat down on the judgment seat at the place called Lithostrosis, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now, it's very, very interesting because the Greek can be translated in two ways. There's one way in which it says that Pilate sat on the judgment seat, but the Greek can also be rendered that he took Jesus and sat him on the judgment seat. So what does he look like sitting on the judgment seat? The king, crowned with thorns crowned in purple. Now, was this Pilate mocking Jesus or was this Pilate seeing something in Jesus? Because remember, Pilate is the one who ends up writing the accusation. And what is the accusation they carry before him? This is Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. And they object. You should have written. He claims, he says, what I have written, I have written. So the first proclamation 
of Jesus' messianic dignity comes from a Gentile, it comes from a Roman official, the procurator Pontius Pilate, who proclaims him the king of the Jews. And he will not take it down. All right. So, we're told it's Passover. It's about 12 noon. What's going on? All over Jerusalem now, they're getting ready of the leaven. The leaven has to be out. They're purging their homes of the leaven in the temple, right starting at 12 noon, because at sundown at 6 o'clock, you know, Passover starts. What are they doing in the temple? Slaughtering the Paschal lambs, all right? And so we go back to the beginning of John's gospel. When John the Baptist saw Jesus coming, what does he say? Ecce agnus Dei. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And that's exactly what's going to happen now. He gets his own cross, and he goes out to the place called the skull, and he is crucified there. And then we have this beautiful passage in 26. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, the same word, (laughs) Woman, behold thy son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. She's no longer just Mary, the mother of Jesus. She's the woman spoken of back in Genesis, right? All right? And so she's the woman. She has her hour. So united in this heart-wrenching agony with her son, she suffers and she goes through the veritable pain of childbirth because what's being born here on the cross is the church, right? It's the church. This is the day of his espousals. And that's why... At the very end, after suffering for three hours, united with Mary, Jesus then is given this stalk of hyssop. Remember, hyssop in Exodus was what was used. They dipped the blood of the Paschal lamb and they used the hyssop on the doorpost, right? So that the angel would pass over on the flight out of Egypt. So again, hyssop is what's being brought up with the sponge for him to take and drink, all right? After they divided his garments and we go through all of this suffering... And in verse 30, therefore, when Jesus had taken the wine, he said, it is consummated. And then he bows his head and he dies. But we know from the synoptics that the last thing he said, he uttered a loud cry, a very loud cry. And it was in Greek, it's teletstai, which, you know, it's sort of like it is accomplished. It is finished. So what it is, it's a cry of triumph. Why? The suffering's done. I have done the will of the Father. It is, a, it, is an, it is accomplished. So he cries this out, and then he gives over his spirit. All right? Now, we're still not done because it's before Passover. And according to Jewish law, if someone has been publicly executed, you have to bury them. So the two thieves are still alive. So what do you have to do? Smash their legs. Break the femur bone. So they can't push themselves up because in crucifixion you die of asphyxiation. That's why when Jesus gives his seven last words, all of them are very short phrases because he can't, he has to hold himself up in this position long enough to get enough air in his lungs. His face would have been blue, his tongue would have been swollen, holding himself in that position so that he can actually say anything. That's why the words are very, very short. All right. That's why everything he says is filled with spiritual meaning. Like when he says, I thirst, it's not that he's thirsty, he's thirsting for salvation of souls. All right. So he's going through this intense agony. Now it's done, and they break the legs of the thieves so that they can't push themselves up, so they die of asphyxiation. Jesus is already dead. So one of the soldiers, we are told in chapter 19... Open his side, interesting choice of words in verse 34. But one of the soldiers opened his side with a lance and immediately there came out blood and water. This is a profound moment for John. Why? Look at what he says in verse 35. And he who saw it has borne witness. And his witness is true. And he knows that he tells the truth that you also may believe. For these things came to pass that the scriptures might be fulfilled. Not a bone of him shall you break. And again, another scripture says, They shall look upon him whom they have pierced. Three times he affirms, He who has seen it is born witness, and his witness is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. This was a miraculous moment for him. And then he says, It also fulfilled scripture. Not only one prophecy, but two. Not a bone you will break, because that's the paschal lamb. 
and they shall look upon him whom they have pierced. A prophecy taken from Zechariah, on that day a fountain shall be opened in Israel that will water that will purify, all right? And all shall see him whom they have pierced. Powerful, powerful moment. Jesus hangs in the sleep of death, just like Adam. His side is opened, and then Eve is going to be formed, the new church. Mary is there with him, united in this heart-wrenching agony. So like the second Adam he is, he hangs in the sleep of death, and the church is going to be fashioned. That's why the fathers look at that blood and water and say, that's the sacraments. That's the sacraments. The water symbolizing baptism, the blood symbolizing Eucharist and all of the sacraments have the power from that blood. So the church is born. I'd like to develop this someday. The birthday of the church is Pentecost, but the church is conceived on Calvary. In the opening of that side, that nuptials where he espouses himself to the church, he gives over his spirit. Once he's dead, it's accomplished. We enter into the age of the spirit. And that's why eventually this is his glorification. This is the book of glory. And that's why when he rises on Easter Sunday and he encounters Mary Magdalene, cling not to me for I am ascending to my father and your father. And then when he comes to the terrified apostles who had run away and had hidden, what's the first thing he says on Easter Sunday? Shalom. Peace be with you. No recrimination. How did you leave? Peace be with you. Then he comes up to them, all right, in 20, and he breathes on them and says, Receive the Holy Spirit. Who sins you forgive, they are forgiven. Who sins you retain, they shall be retained. Because what does he come for? Forgive sins, reconciliation. The Greek word for breathe on them is the exact same word that is used back in Genesis for the creation of Adam. And God breathed into Adam the breath of life, and man became a living being. So after his horrible death, but that glorification, he comes back on Easter Sunday, just like he breathes on them. There's a new creation. Man now can have forgiveness of sins. And through his church and through those apostles, he will be able to forgive sins. All right? And that's the beauty of Easter. That's the beauty of the resurrection. And, of course, the final thing I probably should mention, or Sabatino will get mad at me, is the, of course, in chapter 21, the final chapter, where you get into that beautiful uh, apparition, Jesus by the lakeside. Remember where they're out fishing, and then Peter puts on his clothes and jumps in the water. Kind of crazy, right? You know, puts on his clothes, jumps in the water, swims in, and he gets up there, and what's he see there? A charcoal fire. Remember that? Didn't we hear about a charcoal fire not too long ago? Peter was warming himself by the fire. He denied Christ three times. He's now going to become the good shepherd. Do you love me more than these? Feed my lambs. Do you love me more than these? Feed my lambs. Feed. Do you love me more than these? Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. He says, feed my sheep. And then he's going to be bound and led where he would not go. He makes Peter the shepherd. He makes Peter his vicar. And so that role of Peter, that role of vicar, the teaching of the apostles, will be a continuation of the teaching mission of the glorified Christ. And in a very sort of a quick, rapid run through, this is John's book of glory. He is elevated on the cross and glorified in the cross, drawing all things to himself. That's why Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, who were timid, as soon as he dies, he's raised from the cross. What do they do? They go to Pilate. We want the body. And they're bringing spices to bury him. He's already doing what? Drawing men to himself. And they're coming out of the open. Even though they're members of the Sanhedrin, they don't care. They are his disciple now openly because we're in the age of the Spirit, which is strengthening him. And he's been raised on the cross, drawing all men to himself. And now that he is risen, that word will spread throughout the Roman Empire and will eventually change the course of human history and bring us to the present situation which we're in today where we all know him and love him. And we're very thankful for the part that we're part of his church headed by the successor to Peter, Pope Francis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. O'Donnell. We're going to take about a three or four minute break, and then we'll come back for a short question and answer. Thank you very much, and God bless you. 
Since the Jews could, um, could stone, why didn't they stone Jesus? I know that we wanted him to be crucified so he would be lifted up and all the other s symbolism. But why didn't they just go ahead and stone him? First of all, it seems that they wanted the humiliation and degradation of crucifixion. Second thing, they were not allowed to perform capital punishment. They were they not stone. No, they could not stone. Pilate might have given them permission for that, but they wanted the public degradation of handed over to Gentiles and crucifixion. Uh, some of the confusion comes from the fact that, you know, the woman caught in adultery, they said we should, the law says we should stone. But they knew they weren't supposed, uh, that would have been forbidden by Roman law. They could not do that type of execution. And then also, um, like for example, the stoning of Stephen. A lot of people said, well, how was Stephen stoned? Stephen was stoned probably around 35, 36, right when Pilate had been recalled. So there was no procurator in Judea. So they're sort of taking advantage of the fact there's no procurator. Let's kill him. And so that's what they did. That, um, Dr. O'Donnell, uh, your talk uh, reminded me, especially with the crucifixion, um, reminded me of a book that I read by Dr. Brant Petrie. I think he's down in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. He wrote a book, Jesus and the Jewish Roots of the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. And he talks about, um, in it, that on Passover, you mentioned about the 230,000 lambs that would be slaughtered during Passover, that the Jewish families in taking those homes, home to the um, homes, the lambs would be, um, a stake would be drawn through the mouth, through the body, and then the upper legs would be stretched out onto another stake. So it would be, look, and the, you know, the Jewish families would be holding these up, you know, so it looked like a crucifixion. Yeah. You know. That's a, that's a very good point, and something that John was very interested in emphasizing the Passover is the day of the execution. So the fact that it was from 12 to 3, right at 12 o'clock, is when you would have the slaughtering of the lambs and the sacrifice. So the parallels are very, very intentional. And then mentioning the, the hyssop, which was probably attached to a wooden stalk that would brought up for the sponge. All of those things were calling the Passover lamb. That's huge. It was huge for his information he gave us on John the Baptist, but also very big in terms of his whole passion narrative, because Christ, of course, being the true lamb. So that would have been another example of that prefigurement, which would be very striking. Absolutely. What is the process by which the lambs were inspected for the Passover, and is there a correlation between that process with the high priests and the way Jesus was inspected in front of the high priest, Pilate, and proclaimed innocent by Pilate? Yeah. Well, that's a very good question. Tradition tells us, interestingly enough, that the lambs that were raised for sacrifice in the temple were actually raised in Bethlehem. So that the shepherds field that night, I mean, it adds a certain poignancy to think that the lambs that those shepherds were guarding were the lambs that would be selected. Uh, the Old Testament book of Exodus tells us it was supposed to be a lamb without blemish, without stain, a one-year-old male. So again, there would be a lot of parallels to that. The fact that Jesus, obviously a male, but without blemish. So the fact that this, you know, when you have all these accusations brought against Jesus, and yet the witnesses can't, are in conflict with one another, and they can't really make anything stick, the only thing they finally get him on is blasphemy. They tear the robes. But of course, the fundamental truth we know, was it blasphemy? No. He was speaking the truth. That's why they do try to stone him, a man who told them the truth. So the fact that he remains a lamb without blemish, who is innocent, and that's why the testimony of Pilate is also very important, because we find in Pilate's testimony, three times tries to release him, I find no guilt in this man. He is innocent. And it's very clear that the corruption of the Jewish authorities at that time lead the crowd to cry out, you know, crucify him. And, of course, the worst thing, you know, from sort of a Jewish standpoint is when they say you're not a friend of Caesar. And then you have the leaders say, we have no king but Caesar, which is because God is the only king. That's why, for example, when the shields bearing the image of the emperor were brought into Jerusalem, the Jews protested and were really upset with Pilate, and he wouldn't remove them until they appealed to Caesar. And then Caesar said, remove those. It's not necessary. So that was, again, sort of the thing that kept moving. But they're giving up their birthright. 
They're giving the birthright to God. We have no king but Caesar. And of course, the, the Jews hated Caesar. But it shows you the level of, of hatred and animosity that really was directed towards the person of our Lord, who truly was innocent like a lamb led to, led the innocent lamb led to slaughter. That's how Peter identifies him in his letter. So, very good question. Okay. This is probably a quick question. We'll uh, you've alluded a couple of times during your talk and now that we know quite a bit about the sort of Jewish interactions with the Romans and whatever. And I wonder whether there's any pr other evidence that the Jewish high, the priest, ever turned over anybody o else over to uh, Rome to be executed. That's a, that's a very, very good question. Um, in this particular context, I would have to confess my ignorance. I am not aware of that. However, at the time of the Jewish uprising that Josephus writes about, there were, in fact, Jewish collaborators who collaborated with Rome and saw which way the war was going and things like that, who would have handed over Jewish cities. There were acts of betrayal and, and things like that. But that's more in a wartime situation, not exactly in terms of a, a just, an act of justice. That would be very, very strange indeed, especially when you see them crying for the release of someone like Barabbas, who was a murderer and a robber. You know, free him. They didn't want him to be executed. So I think part of the problem is you have, especially in John's Gospel, as you move closer to the passion, the tension, the arguments, the increasing animosity as Jesus reveals more and more of who he is, it reaches a point where several times they try to stone him. They want him dead, and it's very, very clear. And they realize that there is this galling jurisdiction that they would be in trouble with the procurator if they did it. So they had to bring him. Initially, they tried to hang it on blasphemy. They realized that's not going to happen. But then he claims to be king of the Jews without the permission of the emperor, sets himself as a rival of the emperor. That's what they use, even to the point of saying, selling their birthright, saying, we have no king but Caesar. It just shows the level of animosity. But I'm not aware in a judicial era, someone else might know, but I'm I'm not aware of that. Thank you and very much. Thank you very much, much, Dr. O'Donnell. Okay. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540 Six three five seven one five five, and may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. Saint John the Evangelist, pray for us.